Save time upgrading from Drupal 7 to Drupal 10 using Retrofit for Drupal, which is an extremely long title. But basically, we have a kind of like looming problem-ish problem. Um, Drupal 7 end of life received its last extension at DrupalCon back in June. Um, so it was going to be sometime this year, I believe. Now it's been punted to January 5th, 2025. That's like in the future, but kind of close but still is like a little bit far away, right? It seems like nebulous. Well, here's the problem. Going into like quarter breakdowns, we're at September, right? The end of Q3, we're about to kick off Q4, which your quarter four, the next three months of work has probably been planned already, right? You plan that early in the year. Okay, well, January 5th is five days into Q1 2025. That means you have four quarters to get your Drupal 7 site upgraded and migrated to Drupal 10 or 9, I would say just go for 10. Um, so that means you need to spend quarter four doing your, if you haven't started yet, that thing is like your next three months are, we need to figure out how we're gonna do this and then do it in four quarters because we have one year to do it. And to even break that down more, I usually work in two week sprints. One quarter is about seven sprints. You know your velocity better than I do, but that's a lot of work possibly if you have to all right, let's copy our, let's rebuild our hook, our hook menu into the new routing system. And then, oh, once we have that, we can do our data migration. So let's just take that one year context as we go through this. So, so let's talk about the challenges of migrating from Drupal 7 to Drupal 10, because it is, it's not just an upgrade. 8, 9, 10 are upgrades because it's seamless. It's a migration because things were rewritten. There was data changes. That was the history of Drupal upgrades from four, five, six, seven to eight. Um, you have to migrate your existing content and configuration to its new schema. Drupal seven, there was no configuration management. In Drupal eight, there was configuration management. The entity API became like a first class API in the system and field storage got reworked. Not horrible, but it just means you have to translate that data. Luckily, the Drupal community invested heavily into this. We've got the migrate module, we've got migrate Drupal. Paragraphs has migrations from field correct collections to paragraphs. We've got all this tooling to help you do that data migration. And so that's at least the good part. But then you also have to rewrite your custom code from legacy APIs to the modern API equivalents. Now, this isn't to say that APIs went away. Like You had hook menu in D7, but now it's the routing API, or rather hook menu was part of the menu system, which powered routing, menu links, tasks, and actions. Now those are actually four discrete APIs that have their own ways to be implemented. So it's not tossing it out, but you gotta reconfigure it, if you will. Um, so, and a lot of that went from being a hook that defines an array to there's a new plugin system with these classes and all these other things. Or routing is based off of Symfony's routing component instead of a homebrew option that we used to have way back in the day. You have to rewrite your custom themes from PHP template to the new templating engine of Twig. That's a lot, but it's also nice because Twig is more secure. So like there's pain, but there's good benefits of it, but still it's like, oh, now we have to, we may as well rebrand the website because we're gonna have to touch the entire theme. Adds more baggage to that planning possibly. Here's the part that has always stuck with me. Um, as you're doing this migration, right, you're like, okay, it's gonna take eight months for us to build a Drupal 10 platform. You have an existing Drupal 7 site that you've invested millions of dollars in or hundreds of, th th hundreds of thousands that is a living, breathing platform being used by your organization or others. So it has bug fixes. It has um, product owners that have change requests of things that wanna be fixed. You have to maintain this Drupal 7 site bug fix, make improvements while migrating to Drupal 10 and then creating feature parity with Drupal 10 at the same time. Now, I haven't found a way to clone myself. I don't think development teams have either for that kind of velocity. So when I was thinking about this problem at mid camp and I've had this idea before, and I was like, you know what? We really have only solved the first problem um, about the migration is the data part which in my opinion is like, that's great, but migrating data is probably the easiest part of this all whole thing. Like it's, it's large, but you have tooling for it. Um, so I was like, well, 
what about the other parts? What about the development part of it? What about the velocity, the teams, the people that have to manage this? That's a huge undertaking. How are you going to explain this to your higher ups and say, how, how do I do this or any of the stakeholders? So I was wondering, what if you didn't have to rewrite all the code in your custom modules? No, what if you didn't have to rewrite each and every single line and say, well, this doesn't copy over verbatim, so let's copy paste some lines and put things here. Um, there's no way to review the difference. Like if you're using version control, how can you get diff that you can't? And then also the amount of like cognitive load. Think of your like your team leads, your senior developers that have to review these changes and say, okay, did the junior or mid developer or fellow senior developer port this over correctly? You have to have so you have to understand both APIs and review those differences. That's mentally taxing. And like if we want to talk about burnout, I think that's probably the easiest way to reach burnout is having to do that much work in a short amount of time. And then what if you didn't have to rebuild your theme from scratch? What if there's a way to reuse your existing templates instead of having to take this template which has PHP code in it, that's a bad thing, and then rewrite it into a twig template that doesn't have PHP code. Again, the whole diffing cognitive load. Um, so what if you only needed to refactor 40% of your code instead of 98% of it? And actually I should say like 90% because if you have custom forms, form API from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8 and beyond hasn't changed that much. So if you have custom forms, same with the render system, like render arrays, this really should say 90%. But as a bet, a lot of your default, like your baseline code would have to change, but some of those small areas didn't change that much so you could work. But it's still a lot of code, right? 90% of your code base. What if we can make it only 40%? How much faster could you get to an MVP and start testing your data migrations? Like how much, how much does it increase your velocity? So Retrofit provides compatibility layers to run your legacy code. Um, so that way you don't have to rewrite everything. So what that allows you to do is Retrofit enables you to migrate off Drupal 7 faster and easier as you can start getting immediate feedback. Um, the way I think of it is, all right, well, we have to have our custom page. That means you have to create the routing.yaml and the controllers in the page before you get testing. What if you could just cut, paste, change the info, the dot .info file to dot .info .yaml and have the page there and test your data migration right away? Like That unlocks a big barrier. So, how does this magic work? How does Retrofit work? First off, it's not a module. I know in Drupal we love to call everything a module. It's not. You don't turn it on, you add it, and it just works. Um, one way it does that is Drupal leverages a service container. And for the record, when I say Drupal now, it's 8, 9, 10 plus. If I mean Drupal 7, I'll either say Drupal 7 or Legacy, just to make sure I clear that. So Drupal uses a service container. This taps into the service container. It says, I'm going to add an event subscriber here because you're building routes. I'm going to register a plugin and say that this plugin is actually a derivative. It has multiple versions based off the old APIs. So that's what it does. It, it hooks into Drupal's APIs. And when it does discovery mechanisms, it's like, but wait, there's more. I'm going to call the old hooks and invoke those, take the data, munge it together and call your old callbacks as well when appropriate. This is the part that's a little bit, I had no idea how to best represent this in the slide. So there's going to be, you're not supposed to put like more than five lines on a slide, but there is, I'm just going to walk you through it because I was just staring at this. Like, I don't know how you represent that. Um, it replaces procedural functions. Ooh. But if your code has a bunch of db underscore select, yes, you could use rector or like a search and replace tool to say db underscore select replaces to backslash Drupal database whatever, or you just don't have to do it because it replaces the function for you. Um, again, that goes to the cognitive load. It's not hard work doing that, but it is work. It's stuff that has to be reviewed. So let's remove the actual work of doing it and the work of reviewing it and just let it be. Um, the global user object, this is one that I know is littered in my code, because so you do global user, user has permission, or all these other things. So it takes the current Drupal user, the object-oriented user, and provides a wrapper that lets you access and work with it the old way, where it was like just a plain object that wasn't backed by a class. A few things like that. Um, brought up hook menu a bit, because that was the first thing I worked on. So it takes hook menu, and then turns it into your routing system with controllers and forms, 
and also then registers your menu links based off the setup and your tasks and actions. Because in Drupal 8, menu links, tasks, and actions are YAML plugins. So this says, hey, Drupal, based off this hook menu definition from way ago, these plugins should exist. And the same idea works for hook block. There is a block plugin that it provides and says, hey, when you go discover blocks, invoke the old hook block info. When you build it, here's the old callback, here's the callback for settings. And the neat part is being able to edit a block and it saves it in a quirky way and you still see it on your Drupal site. Um, hook form, I think this was actually the, the easiest and surprised me the most. Like I said, the form API hasn't changed a lot. It just became object oriented and the building of it. So instead of hook form and hook form submit, there's a class that has build form, submit form, but the form state went from being an array to an object. Luckily, PHP has this interface called array access, which lets you work with an object like an array. So it uses a decorated form state, so that way your forms can keep doing all of its form state manipulation pretty much the same way that it did, and not have to edit much code, if any at all. Um, so if you have a hook menu entry that's for a form that says the page callback is Drupal get form, it has a form class that calls all of your methods for the submit, for the validate, and if there's time, I'll run through an example, but the examples module and the forms just work. There's no changes needed to the code in the examples modules from D7. And I feel like forms are one of the biggest customizations outside of themes. Um, so in Drupal 7, we had pre-process and process hooks. I never understood the difference, but people use both, and so I ended up using both. And Drupal 8 was like, we're done with this. But people have logic in those hooks, as found by the Bartik theme and by the examples. So this actually collects all those hooks and says, hey, Drupal, add these as pre-process hooks, but run them last. So that way you don't have to edit that line and add the pre-prefix to that. Again, it's the idea is reducing the amount of lines that have to be changed, the diffs that show up, and the cognitive load. Because it's the little paper cuts that drive us insane. Um, then if you have a hook theme implementation, so theme functions, Drupal 7 let you say, I have a theme hook and this function returns to markup. And then Drupal 8, we said, nope, everything's twig. Well, there's a twig template that Retrofit provides that will, when something says, render this theme, it says, oh, it's a theme hook, execute the PHP function within the twig template and then render the output. So you don't have to rewrite your hook theme implementations if there's a theme function. You can offload that for later um, same if you have PHP templates, it uses the same idea that there's a twig template and a twig function that executes the old thing and then renders it. So if your module has tpl.php files, fine, don't rewrite them if they work. You know, maybe you got to tweak little things inside of it, but if it works, don't touch it. And that's kind of the idea behind retrofit. Um, theme support was the last thing I started to work on. So if you do copy over your theme, there's a lot to be done, but one of the cool parts are template overrides. So if your theme has a node.tpl.php, guess what? It'll be used, and for the most part, it just works. The for the most part goes with there's a lot of internals with theming that changed. It says what gets injected with pre-process, and I want to keep adding that, but it's kind of like a whack-a-mole process. As you can imagine, a lot of those the theming changes didn't have as many change records, so it's hard to go back and do some archaeology or they happened at the initial part of 8.x, or I'm thinking like mid-camp 2014 when everybody was like, hold on, we gotta get Twig and Core, and just so much changed without necessarily all the documentation, because who would think that somebody would try to build a backwards compatibility layer for it later on? <laughs> <laughs> and then one thing I wanted to call out is Drupal Add.js, the function exists, and it lets you attach JavaScript settings. So you know your Drupal settings dot. Adding arbitrary JavaScript and CSS files isn't supported yet because Drupal doesn't support them. But I have ideas on how we can make that work. But if you do, if your code does call like Drupal add CSS, Drupal add JS, it won't crash the site. It collects them behind the scenes so that eventually I can put them on the page. But at least for JavaScript settings, those do bubble up. So if you fix your JavaScript files to use the new asset library system, you don't have to, maybe you don't have to rewrite the JavaScript as much, or as much there. Um, Drupal add library does work. 
it tries to translate Drupal 7 libraries to Drupal 10 ones. So if you did Drupal underscore add library jQuery, it says, oh, actually you want core slash jQuery to be attached to the page. Um, and there's probably a few more like little things in there, but that's like kind of the high level of what it supports, which I'm hoping could get a lot of people just like off the ground running. The site might not look right because there's CSS and JavaScript not added to the page that used to magically get populated, but your core functionality is there. So how do you use retrofit? It does all these things. You don't put this in your Drupal 7 site. You create a new Drupal 10 code base, you add this, then you do a good copy paste of your Drupal 7 modules to the Drupal 10 site. I forgot to put a step in here. So it's like create the Drupal 10 code base, add retrofit Drupal slash retrofit, copy and paste your themes, edit the .info file to .info YAML. As much as I've tried, because I don't like how Drupal does modules, I wish you could just do composer packages for all the things. There's no way to hijack Drupal and say, here's extra extensions that exist. Like it's just too embedded in it. So you do have to modify the .info.yaml. I can't get it to magically parse the .info file and show up as a real extension. So you do have to make that change. And then what you could start doing is migrating your data, visit a page, say, hey, it works, great, let's visit another page. Oh, we got a fatal error because X, Y, and Z. Well, then you go look at that fatal error, refactor the code, test it again, maybe you got to remigrate data, and you can start get run you can start running faster instead of saying, before we can test the data migration, we gotta write code. It's like, no, your code's already written. You just need to create the new Drupal 10 code base and start migrating to it and see what happens. So the idea is iteration and increase in velocity. Velocity velocity. So that ties into like what are the benefits of retrofit? It's like this seems neat. Um, but so the main one I see is incremental upgrades. Why haven't people upgraded from Drupal 7 to 10? Because it's a pain. It's a lot. That is a huge ask for an organization to do. Way back yonder, when I was at a different company, um, there, we, one reason we were going to get hired was to maintain their legacy system so that way they could build the Drupal 8 one because they didn't have capacity. Now, if your organization, that's their solution is, well, we have to maintain this and we have to hire a whole new, another agency to build the new one. That's not sustainable. That's why people would look for off-the-shelf software as a service solutions, which honestly, some sites, great. I, I have a Drupal 7 site that's for my family's snowmobile club. That's going to Squarespace. But a lot of the software as a service don't meet the needs of the organization, so they're going to end up with a poor solution because they look at this giant upgrade task. So I'm, I wanted to enable incremental and iterative changes. Um, which, by doing small changes, that increases your velocity because you get faster feedback, right? I think everybody does agile now. You get the concepts behind small changes, makes you faster, which leads to bigger impact. Um, or, as I've started to take, like, it's like what the military is saying, like, slow is steady, steady is fast. So, and slow in this regard is we're going to make small changes instead of one big one and see what happens, like waterfall. So, you're taking those incremental changes that are slow, if you will, you see it and that builds on top of itself to make it fast. And again, cognitive load. I know I keep bringing this up, but that's because I'm like my day job at Acquia is principal software engineer. I am overseeing and helping lead. And as an open source maintainer for like PHP stand, Drupal, and a few other things, I feel like all I, I don't write code, I review code. So then that's taxing. Like you can only do as much as your code gets reviewed beyond just writing it. So that's why I keep bringing this up and I'm hoping that any of the, the more senior people in here that have juniors, like can you imagine throwing a junior developer at, hey, migrate the site from Drupal 7 to Drupal 10, I, like, and they don't have as much experience and the guardrail is a senior developer? I've been in those situations and it's horrible because you may not be doing as good of a job as a mentor because there's so much to do. So that's one idea behind this is to help improve everybody's life in that regard. And I think upgrades become safer because they're more reliable because you know specifically what you're editing at what time instead of the whole thing. Um, you know, you are using a runtime that provides the backwards compatibility, but at what's 
you have the same risk. You're migrating and copy pasting code and rewriting it, or you have something that's translating it for you. Just one is a one-time thing, one just constantly runs. Um, and I think the biggest benefit is that it provides a larger timeline for refactoring the code. So now your runway, instead of it being four quarters, is, oh, we have four quarters to get our site in Drupal 10 with retrofit, and then we can take more time refactoring away all the legacy Drupal 7 code. So like this morning, I added this onto it. So like, oh, that's right. You could say three quarters saying, all right, we've got it running on Drupal 10 with retrofit. Great, we're going to launch the site in Q4 before the end of life, and then take the next year getting off retrofit. Like we're going to refactor this code and do bug fixes and improvements at the same time. And then my other idea is, as one of the maintainers of PHP San Drupal, which then empowers upgrade status and then the project update bot and all these other things and being the one of the people that's part of the major version upgrades, 10, 11, 12, we're for, we will forever have deprecations in code. Because that's how software is built. You gotta say, we're not doing this anymore, cut it out and get innovation. Now, Drupal core can't maintain these backwards compatibility bridges forever. We're not WordPress. I don't want to be like WordPress because I like what Drupal does. I don't want to have stability that lasts 10 years. I want innovation that lets me build a great experience and platform. So retrofit could fill that gap. So right now my focus is Drupal 7 because that's the, you know, that's the problem ahead. But what if it could provide that bridge for organizations that for some reason after knowing every six months there will be deprecations, what didn't stay on top of it. But they could plug this in and it provides that gaps for the community as a whole. So there is a bigger ver vision of it beyond just Drupal 7. Um, Symphony has something like this called Symphony Flex, which from my understanding, helps provide this idea that you might have varying major versions of Symphony. It was also the inspiration behind my Composer Lenient package as well. Um, and as a shameless plug, if this sounds cool and you're already like, wow, this could save my organization a lot of money. Like I've been told by one person in private, it would save them about $300,000 to $500,000 on their site upgrade. That's known. That's like that's nothing to go like, oh, um, at. So, shameless plug. Um, if you are curious and want to help fund the development, I am on GitHub Sponsors. Um, I recently updated my avatar to reflect my mental state. Uh, uh, so, and a few resources. The slides are now on the TC Drupal session page, so that way, I know you can't click this right now, <laughs> but you can download the slides or you know find that on the internet. But there is a website called, it's retrofit-drupal.com. Um, I've written two blogs about it, if you haven't re read them, but that way you can see like the announcement and then the like proclamation, because before it was like, this is a wild idea I have, then I was like, no, this is a serious project that's not just like some person's like fun experiment. Um, and then I was on the Drupal End of Life podcast with Chromatic, where I first had the idea at Midcamp, and I called it Drupal Bridge, because it was like bridging versions of Drupal. And also I did a little video on YouTube that kind of showed it in action as well. Um, so with that, thanks for attending, and any questions? All right, I'm going to go left to right. Um, I just want to start off by saying I think this is brilliant and evil, um, and it's sort of like somebody built a machine to like kill more puppies or something, uh, but brilliant, for sure. But I, my question is essentially, so since you're running Drupal 10 at its core, you must need PHP 8, and so my I would, I don't have a lot of experience with people who are still on Drupal 7, but I think that someone who hasn't upgraded from Drupal 7 is probably like stuck in older server infrastructure too, and so they're probably running PHP 7. Is that something that you've you've seen as a problem, or is it, because it is still a problem, yeah. right? Like, because during Drupal 10, you need PHP 8. I'll rephrase for the current. So the question is, people are on Drupal 7, which supported PHP 5.4 up to PHP 8.1 it supports, and this has to run in Drupal 10, which is PHP 8.1, what do, what do folks do, right? Like, anybody that I know that has a Drupal 7 platform is running on PHP 8.1, and they're the reasons that Drupal 7 runs on PHP 8.1. There might be some sites that are still on 5.4 legacy, but like, if it's not, if it's there, that means it's probably not maintained, and like, 
or it's just one thing, it just works, and that's why they haven't touched it. So those people that it's like their core platform, and they're like, we're not upgrading because it just works, like they haven't upgraded PHP, there's a little work involved, but I don't think it's that bad. It's like, oh, well, don't, I'm trying to even think of one. It's like, stop using the curly brackets when inter interoperating strings. Like there's really like weird deprecations, but a lot of times the code can just work. Um, so there might be that extra effort involved, which that's where you should use a static analysis tool like PHP stand, and that will tell you, like, as you go, like, all right, we've done this, it's on PHP 8.1, shove it at PHP stand at, like, level two, and just see what comes back. But in my experience, anybody that's on Drupal 7 and hasn't upgraded yet, because their platform is vital to their business, and they're on PHP 8.1, if not PHP 8.2, even. Like, I think, They've patched Drupal core for 8.2. So there's innovation happening on Drupal 7 because people have invested this much money in Drupal 7 as their platform. Is that? Which, as at the mid-camp lightning talk when I presented this, it was the best, worst idea I've ever had. So I share your sentiment. But I think it'll help a lot of people. All right, there was... Have there been any exploration of using like uh, code copilot? To uh, do the migration, and you can try. Okay, here's my existing site. What do I need to do? And then uh, think of using machine learning to come up with the algorithm. Yeah. Okay. So the question was about using AI, generative AI, such as CodePilot, to do it. Um, the problem that I've seen with I use CodePilot. It's great for generating my for each loops and some code comments, but. It's based off of, let's just first look at how generative AI looks. You train it on open source code. GitHub trained it on GitHub code. Drupal code lives on Drupal.org. Laravel, Symfony, all the kind of PHP code lives on GitHub. So it's code generation. It does some Drupal stuff, but for the most part, it's great when I'm doing my Laravel projects, but when I'm doing Drupal code, it's not the best. And it's been trained on like thinking about when it was trained, there's more Drupal 7 code probably than Drupal 8 plus code. So, and I always think of generative AI as like, it's my perfect intern. Not even like an associate developer, it's an intern. So I wouldn't trust it at all. Um, you might be able to say that, hey, I wanna transform this to this format and it, might, it could be a good way to teach you. So like maybe like if you went to ChatGPT and said, I have this hook menu definition what does it look like in Drupal 10? It'll say Drupal 10's not released yet, so then you say Drupal 9, and it might give you the routing.yaml file and a controller. So it could enable you to know the right way to do it, but it's not gonna be correct. So that's just my only caveat. I wouldn't say discount it completely, because by and far, yeah, it is a great learning tool. Like, don't discount, but if you think it's gonna solve the problem, it won't, but if you're like, if you're walking into it, like, I don't know what to do, definitely do that. Go to one of the chat bots and say, I have this, make it work with Drupal 9, and see what it gives you, and it'll probably be much faster than reading the docs. I recommend go reading the docs, but it'll tell you where to go look. On that, there is a session next hour from Matt Cleave about like migrating stuff with Drupal and ChatGPT, so sounds okay. kind of related. So I don't, I don't know much about it besides the title, but I'm so just gonna, like, I would check that out then. <laughs> if there's one about using AI to help improve this, you haven't lied yet. I'm mad. Oh yeah, what? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see that. <laughs> no, I'm mad. Um, any other questions? Mad, mad, yeah. Or would anybody? Okay, what is it? Is it ten thirty or is it ten fifteen? That this is. I think I would have. 10.30. 10.30? Should I show some live code? I've never done yeah. that before. Is, oh. is there anything else you think you want to support? Is there anything else that's outstanding that is missing? Or I really want to do the entire entity system, but I didn't because somebody's like, what about themes? I'm like, who cares about themes? I'm like, wait, everyone cares about themes because everybody put their business logic in their theme. They're not. So um, I want to get themes short up more because I fear that is a big part, but like, I can't wait to dive into making like node underscore load, load a node, and you call field get items and it returns without you changing any code. Like, um, my first idea was like, since I, wa I am still partially co maintainer of Drupal Commerce, it's like, I want Drupal Commerce 1.x to run on Drupal 10. <laughs> now, for those who don't know, that means rules, <laughs> token, any reference margin. <laughs> that's not going to happen, but that's like my uh, lofty goals. 
I think of the triple seven code I've written it, it's glue code. Yeah. And that would be the hardest thing to try and support because data structures are completely different. And they're all so one part is like it's glue code and the data structures alter, are completely alters, different. Right. Yeah, alter, don't worry. It works. It can work. I have I am a, um I never give up and I fully believe that Based off what I've seen in my experience with the people that have written code between Drupal 7 and Drupal 8, people are going to write stuff that's just is like, what? And it just, but it works. And there's always a way to make, find a way to translate. So I Yeah, I was wondering, so you have Drupal 10 up and running with your retrofit, with your Drupal 7 site there. What are your next steps? So the question is like, you have your Drupal 10 site running with retrofit. And you also have your Drupal 7 site running at the same time? Is it, no, you have everything up and running. Oh, everything running in it. Go live. You're live, but now what? Now you take your sprints to say, all right, we have this backlog of things. Well, you should always have maintenance sprints. One, if your organization doesn't do this, like at least once a quarter, take a sprint to just do technical debt, let people have fun. But this isn't just normal maintenance, right? It's not updating dependencies. This is like actually like improving your platform code so maybe you can get a little bit more budget. Just say, all right, we still have this module with the hook menu. Let's just take this one page, right? We're gonna take this one callback and say convert it to Drupal 10. So that way you could wean off of using retrofit or say, this works great, who cares? <laughs> and work on your next thing. But the idea is that to go back, you get launched, and then you take sprints to remove the um, the legacy code. So, you know, and, and one thing I didn't mention, like the first half of it, panelizer, right? I was on a, I, I worked on a at a company where we built a web, ho web a web hosting SaaS for schools, powered by panelizer. Huh, I don't even know what the backwards compatibility thing would be like. Panelizer, the Panelizer D10, if it exists, the layout builder. Like, that's just not a thing. So that's what you're doing in your upfront parts. But luckily with Retrofit, all those other like crufty things you don't care about because you can just focus on the main parts, right? Like you can figure out how do we translate Panelizer in the way we did it to layout builder and Drupal 10, but not how do I rebuild every single page. Um, so that's what you do up front, and then at your tail end, you take out all that crufty legacy code, the old way of doing things, or like I said, decide, this is great, we're doing another platform, this thing can run, and we got a team that maintains it. Go JD, and then I'll go. I, I, might, I came in a little bit late. Did you cover anything about migrating the database from 7 to 10? Yes, and I said that that is where we have invested. The, we, the Drupal community, has invested so much time, money, and effort that I think it's a great, like, it's amazing. The migrate solution in Drupal core, use it all the time, not just for migrating Drupal sites, but for importing data to Drupal. So, like, that was covered. Okay, so uh, do we need to keep the layer, up to date, you know, like, if you update something, do we need to, like, reinstall? So the, the question is about updates to retrofit. So you wouldn't need to like uninstall anything. Like there will be updates because there will be improvements because there will be bugs, but you don't need to change your Drupal 7 code. Like that would be my, that's one of the beautiful things about this is it's not building new APIs, it's bridging APIs. So if you, you shouldn't be writing any of your, your code to use anything retrofit has because it should be behind the scenes. Like you shouldn't know it's there. The one difference is if we got to this 10, 11, 12, because let's take um, one example where I proofed it out with like Drupal 10, module load install was deprecated in Drupal 9 and removed in Drupal 10, I think that's the case. It has retrofit backslash module load install. It provides a, like a backwards compatible function name, but you have to put the namespace. That would be the only thing is if it was such a weird conflict that it needed to be namespaced, but luckily with Drupal 7, that's all been yanked out so long ago, we won't have that issue, but that would be something of concern once we, once the project matures enough to handle the, the current versions of Drupal being upgraded. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. On the, the track, I guess the, the mental track of killing puppies, you had your previous slide, um, with, uh, yeah, 
I, I see a lot of situations where there's going to be a line drawn there, uh, quarter one twenty five. Nothing's going to get done. This is going to get left to 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 live. I suppose the code still executes, but that's not the intention here, right? Yeah. So I mean, I'm trying to think of it like just. Just because people know they have this time, they're not going to actually touch they're it. They're not going to do it. No, like, of course they're not. They're going to get this up and running, and it's going to run. Yeah. And who um, cares at that point? That's what I, I got brought up. I was like, that was one of my fears. Like, I thought about this four years ago. I was like, we can do this. I was like, no, because then we have Frankendruples all, all over the place. <laughs> oh, yeah. But like, I was just back on the, the Drupal End of Life podcast, and I mentioned this. I don't know when it's going to come out. Probably like this week or next. And I brought that up. Like, there's Frankendruples everywhere. I mean, if you open a Drupal 7 site and go to a template file and there's like business, it's a WordPress theme. They've taken like page.tpl.php and made it a WordPress theme. Now, no shade at WordPress because the, like literally in WordPress, the theme is a plugin and that is how you power your site. Drupal has distros, WordPress has themes. But you go to a Drupal site and it's like page.tpl.php. It's like, whoa, they're doing like an entity load and manipulating all this data. That They might say, or sorry, that's the whole Frank and Drupal part to make myself back. Sites are already a good, uh, like when you look at them, um, you know, even my sites, I've been doing Drupal for 10 years, but I don't develop like a Drupal developer. Day one, all right, I need to get an auto loader. I have a source directory and I don't want to write a module. If I have to write a dot info file, I'm just like, oh, really? Why do we still need info files? And why can't I just hook into the service container like Laravel and Symfony and be done with it? Like, I love Drupal first content modeling, not for the way it does here. So there's Frank and Drupal's everywhere, and I don't think this is gonna make it any worse, but it will keep people in our ecosystem. Because I think Drupal is great at a lot of things, and it would be really unfortunate for people to go move their platforms to another system, which is not as good. Because let's face it, Drupal's great at its caching system. Oh my word, I don't know if anybody's had to go to Laravel or Symfony and then build a high performance app with the cache. Drupal is like to Mars, and they're still on Earth. So. I want people to stay with us because it is a great piece of technology that has a lot of intelligent people that have worked on it and continue to work on it. So that's one reason I'm doing this too. Is that? Um, building off of what you just said, I, I can't help but think like, is there any like downside to this that you would want people to be aware of to encourage them to do a, like a true migration? Well, like, a, what about performance? <laughs> yeah. Is there a performance cost for this where you could say, oh, this is a training wheels, but your site will perform better because there's this translation layer. Please tell yes. me. There's a okay, so the question is basically, what are the caveats? Like, what, what, what's, what's going to go wrong? And I need to add it as a slide because one issue that was brought up by Alex Bronstein was what about security? Because one of the biggest, it, Drupal 7, literally every single security issue was cross-site scripting because of PHP template. Twig basically killed 75% of all the security issues. Now we're bringing it back. And almost worse because in Drupal 7, there was at least parts of pre-process that's sanitized HTML. Like let's take, and their example was field output. It would take the field label and sanitize it since that's user input from the admin before it's printed. That's gone because Drupal doesn't do it anymore because it has Twig. So Retrofit will need to plug some of those in. But the way I look at it is, all right, Drupal did it for you in a few places. You probably did it or didn't even know you had to do it. So you know worse off. Like, There's one there. Um, for performance, this is all about when you implement an API. So that's always an expensive operation that gets cached. Sorry, I shouldn't say just an API. When you have like some kind of what's not like a plugin discovery blocks, well, that's a one-time discovery process unless your site's really broken and it does it more. But let's take the routing system. Again, that's a discovery. It says, what are my routes? Well, it just, it loads that code. Now, I have seen where people did some things in hook menu that was like dynamic because they thought it was a dynamic process. There could be a performance hit there. Like there's always weird things, but you always had those problems is how I've seen it. And you've always had those quirks. Maybe now it'll show that you have them and make you fix them. Um, but let's take the, you know what? Let me see if I can, I can't finagle it this way. Um, but the route goes to a controller class. And the controller class literally says, 
hey, when you did discovery, what was the page callback before? Execute the function. So it's a very thin layer that doesn't do a lot of calculations. You know, it has a parameter converter that says, hey, before people expected if the route had node in it to execute node underscore load. So it does that thing as well. So it executes the different loaders. So I haven't done performance testing, but it is mostly at the discovery process and not much runtime while your Drupal site's executing code. Like I brought up form state. It just says use a form state that is wrapped or decorated so that way it has array access. That's like a different class. It's not extra code. JD. Do you think there's a chance that you will forego performance testing as an incentive for people to do that Q125 on, hey, we have to stop that in place, but our site isn't performing nearly as good as it could be? Question is about the performance testing. Um, will it incentivize people? Oh, will it incentivize people to do performance testing? Do, no, not do performance testing, but if you don't do performance testing oh. on, on uh, retrofit, if you don't care about performance in retrofit, will it incentivize clients, customers, who maybe wouldn't want to do all that refactoring legacy code, give them a reason to do it so that as developers or client-facing people say, you know, we can get you to 10, it'll work, but you're taking this hit by staying here, here's why we need to upgrade the Got it. So the question, let me see if I can rephrase it right, is if Retrofit's not providing performance guarantees, it can almost be an incentive for folks to get off of it and finish refactoring their code. Like, we'll get you here, there might be a penalty because you are using this compatibility layer. Hey, that's not necessarily a bad thing, let's just use it as motivation to get off of it. Yeah. Um, I think that's fine. I might want to add it because I really don't want like somebody to use it and it's really bad. Well, but, <laughs> and, but like as I think of it, even like the whole twig template thing, like, oh, your theme, theme hook used to be a theme <coughs> function. Well, Drupal already knows it's this twig template, and that twig template is executing a twig function that calls that code. So it's very, like, there are extra steps, but we're talking, like, what what's the fancy US symbol for, like, less than microseconds? Like, I'm on a time. You just put some timeouts in it, then. <laughs> you know, I, did, I need a way to get monetization. Maybe I should just put, like, some. <laughs> Enter a license scheme, we get those out. Yes. At least a, a status notification that says, hey, this is running. Oh, that would be interesting. Like, so the, the question was like, a status notification knowing it's running. That's, and I'll, I'll, if I don't make an issue for it, help remind me about it. Um, that would be interesting to hook into like Drupal's requirements hook and say, hey, you're running with retrofit. That is actually a brilliant idea because people may not even know it's running. Which I would love that if someone's like, we're on Drupal 10, this is great. Oh, that's right, we still are using retrofit. I would love that day because that just means this was a success. So, all right, now I think we're at time. It's 10.30, right? Okay, thank you everybody for coming. I hope this was fun and I hope you appreciate my mad scientist experiment and I really hope it might help you in the future. How many puppies will kill?